Hello, everybody. Okay, now I think we um, we were missing for the most important part of this EDPF civil society summit. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be a civil society summit. But <laughs> uh, good to have uh, to have everyone. So um, my name is Claire Fernandez. For those who don't know me, I'm the uh, ED of EDRI, European Digital Rights. Um, so we would like to start by thanking the EDPF for this uh, summit and for keeping this tradition of exchanging with civil society. Um, thank you also to representatives, if there are any of uh, data protection authorities, uh, they are. <laughs> uh, and of course, thank you to all civil society organization representatives and every member who came to, to share with us uh, their knowledge and expertise on facial recognition. So uh, there are still three seats at the table. So those people are not here, so feel free if anybody wants to come further to the table, that would be great that we don't have empty seats. And I think generally, if there are more people outside of the round table than at the round table, maybe we could reconsider the formats next year to have like a more open discussion. But it's great to see a lot of, of you here. Um, so yesterday, uh, the Google CEO, uh, Sundar Pinchai, was in town. At, I'm, I'm sure you've all seen the buzz around that. And he actually um, was calling for regulation in certain parts of uh, AI in certain sectors. He actually called um, and said that facial recognition was one of the higher risk applications of AI. Of course, we know that uh, face recognition and other biometric technologies are already being used by governments and corporate um, corporations alike, but without clear independent oversight or actually debate in civil society and in, in wider public whether or not people want this technology to be used against them. So such events and discussions are quite quite good for that. Um, and on today's privacy camp topic, which is the link between technology and activism, actually it's for most civil society organizations and for EDRI members, it's not really a surprise. It doesn't come to a surprise that facial recognition is used to curb uh, dissent. For years, activists, um, protesters, people of color, migrants, um, and other uh, activists have really long felt um, the weight and, and the, the weight of being over policed and over surveilled, and have already called for a long time for, for banning some technologies. Actually, what is new is the scale of the problem, and with uh, the, the advance in technologies and the new analytical capabilities that those technology offers to law enforcement and to uh, intelligence agency, we, we are really concerned about the scale that this problem could take. Uh, so from, a from, from a fundamental rights perspective, we at EDRI are really particularly concerned about two things. Um, First of all, the lack of accountability and also the increase in power for, for some state actors. So less accountability because there is clearly a shocking lack of uh, transparency and accountability on the use of uh, facial recognition in, uh, in public spaces. And w whenever there are attempts at EU level to kind of limit um, either through the GDPR or other new, possibly new uh, regulations um, to limit and to bring an oversight to police and law enforcement and, and um, intelligence agencies, member states then hide under national security or terrorism exceptions. Um, we, we also feel that data protection authorities are very cautious or simply not able or simply overloaded to start to look into um, these issues. And other uh, human rights organizations like ombudsmen also sometimes just lack the capacity or, or um, um, resources to do so. More power, because at the same time, of course, facial recognition technologies and biometric surveillance increase the adverse impact um, of police and surveillance powers. And those powers keep kind of growing in the current context of more counterterrorism and more surveillance legislation that is being that we've seen around the EU and sometimes because of EU legislation and policies as well. Um, so the result is that facial recognition can affect like everyone in our daily life, including um, children and in public spaces. And again, minority groups are uh, disproportionately affected because they are over policed, but also because of some of the technical misidentification risks that are higher for this population. And in the context of uh, rule of law breaches around Europe and uh, increased police violence, for instance, in France, 
um, we are really concerned that uh, the fundament right fundamental rights implications uh, of face recognition and we would like to see urgent action. In the EDRI network, we started consulting uh, some of our members and there are emerging kind of consensus about what should be done, of course, with some nuances. We chose also the, the complexity of dealing with it and of course on, on whether uh, and how uh, we could regulate uh, facial recognition in public spaces in particular. So I'm really eager to hear from, uh, from the speakers uh, about concrete cases and what do you think about how we should move forward. Um, thanks again to, to the EDPS for the financial support to the whole of Privacy uh, Camp and to this event in particular. I would like to also thank the EDRI team while I'm at it, uh, Jan for organizing this particular uh, summit and of course Andrea for the fantastic job around Privacy Camp. So um, I, I look forward to, to hearing you and I would like to then pass the mic to our moderator of today. Yeah, yep. okay, um, sure, of course. So then I will pass to, to uh, Alexander who is going to moderate the, the event. Sorry, I just wanted to say hello and uh, good morning or rather good afternoon. Uh, I'm really very happy to be here. This is uh, my probably third uh, visit uh, to the uh, privacy camp uh, and uh, not of course not the first uh, meeting with the uh, NGOs. Uh, I've been quite involved in the cooperation with NGOs also in the previous mandate uh, and I can tell you that uh, when I unfortunately had to take uh, over from Giovanni in uh, uh, August, one of the first things which landed on my table was uh, will uh, because I, I said to the people that we are not going to organize any new actions for the new mandate because we have to wait for the new supervisor who will be elected by December and then the people came to me and said and what about the privacy camp and what about the, me uh, the meeting with the NGOs I said okay w we don't change anything whoever will come here will have to stay in the contact with the civic society and that will be the, the main source of the information for us as well so that was absolutely obvious that you should be here and uh, of course the facial recognition is the part of the things which we are dealing with uh, th this mandate the only thing which I was stressing also at the Freedom of Fear conference is that we treat it as a little bit separate subject from artificial intelligence. That's uh, uh, also important subject, the one to be discussed, uh, but we don't want to be to it to be thrown in to one basket with the artificial intelligence as such, because there are the things which are overlapping, but there are also a lot of different things which, where for example, facial recognition can be also dangerous if it's not connected with any kind of artificial intelligence and uh, uh, not all the fears which are in, ar in artificial intelligence are in facial recognition and other way around. So there are definitely a lot of things to discuss about and uh, we are f first of all here in the listening mode uh, uh, trying to get to know from those people who have the contact on everyday basis with this uh, phenomenon. Great, many thanks. Hello everyone, um, thanks for the wonderful introduction Claire. And but um, I'm uh, Alexander Fanta. I'm a journalist covering digital rights um, here in Brussels. Um, I work for Netzpolitik.org, which is a German website um, for that type of news. Um, so um, we'll, we'll have two um, short sessions, one on use cases of uh, facial recognition technology um, and another one on uh, regulation. Uh, Claire already said kind of most of what, um, what is important on this issue. I just wanted to point out, um, for one, that you know this is a kind of topic that now um, is is coming up almost on a daily basis uh, in in the media. A lot of you might have seen the New York Times story on uh, Clearview AI um, that was published on Saturday, um, and um, the Commission, uh, the new Commission of Ursula von der Leyen, has obviously said she wants to act um, very quickly, wants to um, publish a white paper within her first hundred days in office. We're now expecting it in, um, in within the next month. So this is something that is very, very high on the agenda of um, lawmakers at the moment. And uh, I think it's a very um, opportune moment to have this debate. Um, so we have, uh, we have let, let me just introduce the first two speakers. Um, so we have uh, um, Noemi from uh, uh, La Quadrature du Net. You're a, a privacy lawyer um, focusing on um, these kind of data protection uh, cases, some high profile ones that La Quadrature is pursuing. Uh, and we have Danilo, I, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, who I, 
I'm, I'm informed is director of SHARE Foundation, and maybe you can just tell us a little bit about, about yourselves. Um, so I'll, I'll just pass the mic to Noemi and you follow that straight into it. Thank you, and thank you for inviting La Quadrature du Net to speak about what's going on in France. And there is a lot to say, so I'm going to try to be as brief as I can. Uh, so facial rec the debate about facial recognition has gone stronger uh, for the past few years. But actually in France, uh, the story of facial recognition started discreetly in 2012, uh, when the government upgraded and updated uh, the biggest police file, called the TAG file, uh, which process and gather all the information about criminal backgrounds of people. So it's not criminal records, it's uh, even if you're a witness, if you're a victim, if you're charged but found not guilty, you are in this file. And in 2012, the government allowed the police to use every photo in this file uh, to make facial recognition um, in their police, police work. So today, there are 80 million cases in this file, 20 million people and 8, pil and eight million of photo photos. Uh, so I, at, at that time, uh, nobody really talked about it. Uh, with La Quadrature du Net, we released an analysis of uh, what, what the police can do with this file today. Uh, um, with cross-processing cross with other files, actually it can be very dangerous and we have very big concerns about uh, misuse uh, of this file uh, for, for example, identifying protesters. And so we attacked it a few months ago to make it more public because for us it's one of the main dangerous use of facial recognition because it can be very uh, very broad and very intense. So this was eight years ago and then we had to wait a few years to see some very practical and material use of facial recognition. So the first one was uh, in the, the two airports in Paris, uh, was Charles de Gaulle and Orly, which um, at customs, when the people are supposed to go see a human people and show the pa passports, now you have some gates with facial recognition process. So you put your passports, which scans your photo, and then you go through the gates, and facial recognition helps you go through customs. So for us, it's a typical example of public authority wants to accustom people and legitimate this technology, making it more convenient because the line is uh, shorter, of course. So this was in 2017 and 2018. And 2018 is really the time when we, with La Quadrature, we started studying and analyzing what's going on in France. Because what we saw is a raise of uh, cities, actually it was at national, but cities uh, promoting technologies, uh, facial recognition or biometric technologies to sales as they call safe cities and smart cities and um, starting to to um, to go see French industries to to put some some intelligent uh, CCTVs for example in the streets so it began mostly in the south of France <laughs> because they are very fond of technologies in the south of France uh, so, for, uh, for example, in Nice and Marseille, uh, two high schools uh, started to build and to install some uh, facial recognition gates at the entrance of the high school. So they sold it as very secure and uh, useful to, to counter some terrorist threats because uh, the, the kids would go faster in the school, as they say, and so we attacked it. It was uh, in 2018. At that time, the French DPA, the CNIL, didn't say much. Uh, we had to wait one year for the CNIL to finally say ruled it illegal and disproportionate. Uh, and so today, the if the, f the um, we don't still don't have a lawsuit, but the, the gates are not implemented yet. Uh, but still in Nice, at the same time, there was an experiment during a carnival where people, so five or ten people, consented uh, to give their photos and, and participa participate in an experim experiment of live facial recognition so they could, could be recognized in a crowd 
So they made a, bit, a lot of noise about these experiments, but today there are no accurate and public results about it, so we don't know if it worked, and we, we just said it was, uh, the, the city of Nice is very into this technology, they are, as they are uh, saying it's, ho it's wonderful. So at that time, with La Cordature, we wanted to, to document and uh, show and make, make people involved uh, as a city and a local level um, to for them to be aware of what was going on in their cities. So we launched a campaign called Technopolis, uh, which gathers all the information about stakeholders, uh, French industries, French businesses who sell those biometric technologies and in which cities they, they, they do it. We also encourage people to ask to the mayor public documents because today those technologies are implemented very uh, in a secretive way so so we launched a website we launched um, we launched it uh, six months ago and for example it made uh, in uh, in saint etienne the city wanted to put some microphones in the streets uh, that would be uh, that could record weird noise and with uh, of course in dangerous neighborhood and uh, for example, screams or uh, broken glass uh, noise. And the local community there uh, protested, pr protested a lot. And of course it didn't, it made, it made the project go, didn't, didn't launch. And then the French DPA, the CNIL finally ruled, well, sent a letter to, to Saint-Etienne saying that it was illegal at that for the moment. <laughs> And for example, in Marseille still, and it's the same in Toulouse, we, there are some uh, intelligent CCTV, as they called, automated video surveillance, video surveillance that can help uh, the police take a de decision. So they say that it can uh, recognize uh, some behavior, that can it can recognize some crowd movement or some weird or unusual uh, way of walking. So again, we attacked it in Marseille yesterday or last week. <laughs> and so th there is a lot of biometric uh, technologies in the cities and the problem in France is that it's very secretive. And so we ask for public documents a lot. And uh, while we are doing that with Technopolis, actually the debate raised a few months ago because the French government said it would launch an app called Alicem which uh, allows people to connect to their public service uh, online, like for example, paying your tax or uh, going to see your public health insurance. And this app uh, will only work with uh, facial recognition. So we, we attacked it, but actually two months later, we don't, know really, we don't really know why. Yes, I think it was because of an article, the media really started to talk about it, and this is when facial recognition became a really big debate in France. And um, so right now, as a conclusion, so what's uh, for the picture, what's going on in France, you have two types of stakeholder. You have, uh, on one hand, uh, the Minister of Digital Affairs that really sees it uh, with a commercial and uh, industrial perspective. Uh, as you want some French uh, businesses to to sell facial recognition and um, and biometric technologies, and he wants uh, ex to experiment it to frame it legally, but for an experiment for experiment it. And on the other hand, you have La Quadrature du Net and other organizations who ask for a ban of uh, use of facial recognition and and uh, biometric technologies. Uh, when it's in public space and uh, for uh, security purposes. Great, thanks for that. So um, there's a kind of a lack of oversight, uh, a la lack of data still on what, what's going on. Um, so I'm, I'm handing over to you for the Serbian perspective. Thank you. Uh, so my name is uh, Daniel Okrokapic and I'm director of Share Foundation and also a data protection lawyer. And yeah, uh, I will try to present the, the, uh, the Serbian case. We are luckily not so advance advanced at France. So uh, at the moment, police is saying that they are not still using 
facial recognition, te facial recognition technology, but I think this case is, uh, is really interesting. So just a bit of a context. So Serbia is a post-socialist country. It's a EU member candidate, but it's also constantly balancing between USA, Russia, and China. Uh, and if I would like to be polite, I would say we are fragile democracy, at least, yeah. And also, it's interesting that um, in Serbia, for more than a year, we have um, anti-government protests uh, ev every week. So, and how how did this all start in Serbia? Then maybe I'll go to 2014, and there was this uh, famous case of uh, uh, hit and run in this fugitive, and for months our police tried to find this person. All newspapers wrote about this, and then somehow they found out that he's in China. And after they sent the picture to China, they found this person in less than two days. So this is when our police saw this technology as like something amazing that can help them solve all the problems. And um, uh, uh, after this, they signed many secret contracts and agreements with the Chinese government and Huawei. And at the beginning of last year, so 2019, um, our minister of police uh, announced that uh, finally uh, they're going to install more than 1,000 cameras and practically cover the whole city with these uh, cameras in uh, cooperation with Huawei and also that they are going to use a facial recognition software. So what was uh, most interesting about this is that uh, this, this was done with uh, total lack of awareness how this technology could uh, uh, affect basic human rights. So this was the basic story. Okay, we all we are buying this great technology, and it will help us uh, solve all the all the problems. So when I, I'm just going to cite him. So what he said is every important street will be cover uh, will be covered with cameras, and we will know where everyone came from, when, and with whom. So he was basically bragging about this, uh, and this was all all done, of course, without any any public debate and for us what was the most interesting <laughs> here was the scope uh, of using of this technology so this is not like using of facial recognition at uh, airports or maybe on stadiums or something like that this was like uh, it, it wasn't uh, so difficult to imagine uh, how can this all turn out covering the whole city with cameras and uh, giving all this technology in the hands of uh, law enforcement authorities for whom we know that uh, are misusing uh, personal data. We know this because uh, we research uh, how they are accessing uh, retained data, uh, mobile retained data, and they are accessing it uh, without court order uh, hundreds of times a year. And Serbia only has some something like six million people. So it's like, it's a very big scale. So. Um, so what we tried to do uh, at the beginning uh, was the same as you tried, uh, Freedom of Information Act, give us the information, this, is, this, should, this should be public information, and uh, uh, we tried to know uh, what was the procurement process, what is the price, what type of technology is used, where this camera will be placed, and so on and so on, and uh, uh, as you may guess, all, um, all documents were classified as confidential, so yeah. So we didn't get anything, but luckily for us, um, more than a year ago, Huawei published on their website a case study of Belgrade. So this is the first time that we got any info about it, because of course Huawei is trying to sell this, uh, this equipment, and uh, this is the first time that we got any information about some cameras that are installed in Belgrade, some technical, uh, details and interestingly enough after we did analysis of this text translated into Serbian and published it in less than 10 hours this uh, case study was removed from Huawei website of course we archived it you can see it on our website but yeah this was interesting how this our government and uh, this private company were, were really synchronized so 10 hours is a really not so so big so much time so wha what did we do for all this time in the last year? Uh, I think we uh, did a lot. Uh, we got um, huge help from other community. Uh, many people were interested. We got uh, 
many advices and it was really important for us to have this um, infrastructure of Edri so to be on top of things you know so because this was this was something new in our society and we were basically at the beginning the only entity that was interested in, in this topic so um, we actually got a quite a, a lot of interest of uh, local and uh, international media I would say this is because of the Chinese thing in the story but I mean for us this is not important I mean this could be Chinese technology American European or even Serbia technology if we would be able to make one but um, yeah and uh, also what was very interesting for us is that uh, this story became really interested to other organizations that are not traditionally in this area so we made the new partnership uh, advocating um, against this implement implementation of this technology and many citizens and what was also interesting uh, when we talked about facial recognition and cameras uh, cameras it was much more uh, it was easier to reach general public uh, than when we are talking about some equally important issues such as I don't know how platforms are using our data but for them this is not comprehensible but cameras and this kind of software uh, definitely is so uh, what we what was also interesting is that after we raised this issue uh, almost all opposition political parties uh, 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 wrote or talked about this and also were against this kind of technology so it was it was it was this was this is good and uh, now I'm coming to the I, uh, do to the legal issue so w uh, what was our first thing uh, some of uh, you may know but uh, uh, in the summer of last year a uh, new data protection law came into force in Serbia and it's practically adaptation or more truthfully translation of GDPR and police di directive and uh, the first thing we, we start advocating is if you're implementing this kind of uh, the system you need to do data protection you need to assessment before the processing is starting and this was our first thing that we uh, were pushing 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 and because the at, uh, after the year we were pushing this issue and it, it got some attention by medias so only one month after uh, the law came into force our police made a document that they call data protection impact assessment regarding this smart surveillance and they send it to our uh, DPA uh, so w uh, luckily we got this uh, document because now DPA had this document sorry I'm finishing and uh, this was the only name was DPIA but inside there was nothing of the element that should be there like no comprehensive description of the processing no risk assessment no measure to be taken and so on so on so now uh, luckily DPA uh, did the same analysis as we so it basically gave back this document to police and said them that they need to do this better so uh, but these are s so they're going to do this better I'm, f I'm sure but for me what's the most important I'm sure they will not be able to prove that this kind of data processing is necessary and proportionate in democratic society so maybe they will have all the elements but I, I cannot how I understand how somebody can uh, explain uh, this so uh, as I said now the ball is in Ministry of Police Court and we are waiting for them but w I think we have uh, enough of uh, legal uh, instruments to 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 fight this issue and that's it for now thank you I think this was a very instructive and interesting example of what's going on. Um, just for time's sake, um, I'd propose to just um, uh, go on to the, to the next set of speakers and then open um, up for questions and interventions right after this. Um, yeah, with this I'd like to pass on the mic um, to our next two speakers. Um, so we have... Uh, Lotte from uh, Bits of Freedom in Holland, um, and I think she's going to talk a bit about um, the uh, examples there, uh, and um, the especially the regulatory framework, which we're interested in. Yes. Well, um, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be able to share our thoughts with you today. 
um, I will stick to what Bits of Freedom is most worried about, and this is the use of biometric surveillance technologies in public space. I will talk specifically about facial recognition, but many of the concerns raised apply to other types of biometrics as well. Recently, we've seen numerous organizations calling for a moratorium on, on face surveillance. The most heard arguments include the lack of demonstrable necessity, the biased and inaccurate nature of the technology, and finally, the absence of a regulatory framework. However valid these arguments are, we believe they aren't going to help us win this battle. Please, let me explain why not. First, the focus on necessity. We will heartedly agree with the EDPS that any interference in our fundamental rights must be demonstrably necessary, and convenience and efficiency do not amount to this demonstrable need. However, how many surveillance measures have we seen being introduced with a poorly motivated, let alone demonstrated necessity? Unfortunately, we believe we desperately need more in terms of protection. Secondly, there's the question of inaccuracy and bias. Our worries as regards to arguing for a moratorium on the basis of this concern is that the technological deficiencies might be solvable over time, at least to an extent that brings the percentage of false positives and negatives within the realms of what our political leaders deem acceptable. More importantly, however, is that we might just be looking at the technology that becomes more dangerous the better it works. Not when it's given you access to your phone, but definitely when applied as a mass surveillance tool. Finally, calling for a regulatory framework might imply to some that current legislation is ambiguous about the acceptability of face surveillance. We need to be very clear that assessing face surveillance in light of the European Convention on Human Rights, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, and the principles set out in the general data protection do not leave space for the, for the deployment of facial recognition surveillance in public space, since it re requires mass-scale processing of biometrics, period. More than anything else, what a moratorium will result in is time. Time in which the technology will become normalized. Time in which industry will deploy its lobbyists. Time in which the companies at the forefront of product development search for and find product, mar product market fit. Time in which civil society will again and again mobilize citizens until those citizens become fatigued and wary and disbelieving that their voice makes a difference. We're concerned, therefore, that the demand for a moratorium isn't bold enough. I would like to take this opportunity to explain why we believe we need regulation, be it new or interpretations of existing legislation, banning the deployment of facial recognition as a surveillance tool in public space. First, there is no question that we're talking about a mass surveillance tool that will severely limit our rights and freedoms. No balancing act or proportionality assessment can make the infringement caused by face surveillance fair or just. Second, facial recognition surveillance in public space, in our view, is clearly incompatible with our data protection framework. In other words, Face surveillance is illegal. Biometric data are extremely sensitive and due diligence requires limiting the processing of this data as much as possible. As we know, facial recognition surveillance in public space inherently requires mass scale proces processing of biometric data. A study from 2016 shows that half of all United States adults are already included in a law enforcement facial recognition database. In the Netherlands, it is already one in every 13 adults, and we just heard about France. We cannot opt out or avoid public space. We cannot change our face or leave it at home. So let's treat our face as something valuable. Finally, we are concerned we will not be able to contain the use of face surveillance. History has taught us never to underestimate a good function creep. There are several ways the use and effects of facial recognition surveillance might expand over time. First, the legal basis and or the scope of the basis can be expanded. Limiting the use of such far-reaching te technology to combating terrorism might sound limited, but the limitation and therefore protections are dependent on government classifications. 
Several examples around the world, including in the Netherlands, show that even non-violent citizen interest groups are classified, classified as extremist or terrorist when more powers to surveil these groups are desired. A second example of how function creep will take place is with regards to access to the data. Waving the fraud prevention flag and showing a complete distrust of citizens, government institutions are very keen to share access and combine databases. Why would facial recognition databases be exempt from this data hunger? Calling for a moratorium is risky. We believe we need to be bolder. We're in agreement for the most part that our human rights and data protection frameworks protect people against tracking online. We now need to agree that they do the same offline. Thanks again for the invitation to elaborate on our position with regards to the use of facial recognition in public space. I welcome discussion on the topic and I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts. Thank you. Great, many thanks. So a ringing proposal for a a wholesale moratorium on face recognition, which is something that a recently leaked um, uh, commission white paper proposal was um, putting on the table as a possible policy op um, option, but not exactly endorsing. Um, I will now pass on to Johannes uh, with uh, Privacy International in London. And um, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Alex. Um, and also thank you very much for the invitation to be on this summit and uh, to be able to contribute to the discussion. Uh, although we hadn't really planned this, my intervention pretty much reflects the points that Lotte already mentioned, so we're pretty much on the same page. What I would try to do uh, in order not to replicate this is maybe rely a bit on the points that were not raised and relate to whether there is a need for new regulation. And um, Claire mentioned this in her introductory remarks on whether uh, the debate about whether we need a new law or a new regulation on this issue is really necessary. Uh, to be honest, I'm not entirely convinced that what we need is a new regulation, and I might sign sound a bit cynical, but we also saw in the leaked paper by the European Commission on AI in general that what they were actually calling for besides the moratorium or the temporary ban for two or three years, I think, was also a precise risk assessment of benefits and also to be able to map the exact consequences on human rights that this technology or generally the use of AI might bring. Although I agree with the distinction between AI and facial recognition and I'll try to be more specific focusing on facial recognition. Um, I think that what would be more important is to see what we are eventually asking for and if what we are asking for is uh, active enforcement and if we want to bring a new regulation in the game to achieve active enforcement, although this can already be done with existing regulations. So the rest of my points are going to just touch on certain issues and they're by no means exhaustive and unfortunately they're not going to provide a solution to the debate. But hopefully it would be good to hear the rest, uh, the rest of participants' views and also to have a supervisor's take on this issue. And uh, to begin with, before talking about regulation, I think it would be important to make a clear distinction between the kind of technology, even in the facial recognition context that we're talking about, and to separate between the different uses, purposes, combinations, and actors that are deploying this kind of technology. We already have, for example, the Article 29 Working Party opinion uh, from 2012 that separates between authentication, identification, verification, as possible purposes. These are still purposes. I think we should take it one step further and see also the possible uses. For example, are we talking about the deployment of live facial recognition in public spaces? Are we talking about the deployment of facial matching? This is a term that mainly police in England and Wales like to call it, which is the uh, retrospectively matching of facial images or custody images with certain databases that they might hold. And um, Thirdly, another distinction that I find crucial is the distinction between private actors and public actors. I mean, the actors that are deploying this technology. This will inevitably uh, affect the framework that is to be applied and therefore the safeguards. And then we can talk about whether safeguards are adequate, the existing ones, or whether we need new ones. And um, getting back to the point on uh, the different uses of facial recognition technology, I think there's pretty much a consensus right now among CSOs that the deployment of live facial recognition in public spaces cannot adhere to, s to human rights. 
and uh, in terms of regulation, I think hu existing human rights principles are already ruled that as um, incompliant. I think the most convincing one, without going into details on necessity or proportionality, should be the fact that it immediately violates human dignity per se, and as such, it fails to comply with the essence of fundamental rights. Uh, talking about the EU context under the Charter, and then we can take it a, a step forward when it comes to the European Convention of Human Rights, although it's debatable whether, whether a core or essence exists, but it seems to signal that a core, like the essence of dignity should still be there. And um, then, when we separate between public actors and private actors that deploy this technology, we can bring in examples of the corporate use of it, for example, we have certain cases of uh, private schools using facial recognition to monitor attendance. We have certain cases of bars or cafes using facial recognition in order to avoid queues, or shopping malls using facial recognition to track customers. On the other hand, the most common example when it comes to public actors deploying the technology is policing, and uh, public security, national security, and so on. This inevitably affects the framework that is to be applied, and. Uh, to move on now that we have kind of clarified the situations that we could be talking about or the situations that we want to have somehow regulated, leaving aside the deployment of live facial recognition in the public context, I think what we are looking at is whether there are certain principles that regulation should abide by and whether these principles already exist. Because if we think about accountability, transparency, this was mentioned by various speakers, uh, I don't think that these are not already covered under existing frameworks. When it comes to the corporate context, the general data protection regulation provides for impact assessments, accountability, transparency, information notices. And when it comes to the, uh, to the deployment in the context of policing, we also have the law enforcement directing in, in its implementation into the EU member state framework, again in the EU context. And uh, of course we also have the European Convention on Human Rights, the European Charter of Human Rights, among other instruments. So if these are issues that we're experiencing now and we're talking about a framework that is not adequate enough or we're talking about a framework that is not precise enough, this is already something we're complaining about both in the corporate exploitation context and the government exploitation context. For example, the fact that information notices are not adequate because police are deploying facial recognition at airports uh, is not something that necessarily a new regulation might be very different from what the strings and safeguards of CDPR already require, for example. So I, I think the issue here is more about active enforcement or at least signaling a clear position on whether this is permissible or not. And uh, of course there is this the counter argument here that we saw in the quite recent uh, October judgment on automated facial recognition in the UK. I think this was the first judgment on automated facial recognition, that there was a very strong counter-argument brought by the police in that context that uh, the processing of this category of biometric data could not fall under uh, the definition of uh, special category data. This was uh, rejected by the court in a very, in a very interesting ruling. But uh, besides that, to be honest, I do not see any other reason for at least these kind of transparency or accountability standards to be further implemented rather than a regulation that would be merely repeating the existing ones. There is only one point that a new regulation or a new kind of attempt to regulate this technology could bring added value to, and it's the enhanced authorization processes or very specific standards on how this technology can be deployed. This would somehow be an effort to shed further light on foreseeability, accessibility, or quality of the law standards. For example, by designating specific people within a police body that, can, that are able to authorize the use of the technology if this technology can ever be deployed. Uh, then, of course, comes the question of whether this should be done at a na is achievable at a national level or whether this should be achievable at an EU context. Uh, and then, of course, whether we want to leave this further regulation of authorization processes to certain executives within EU member states. And, um, and of course this leads back to the debate on mass surveillance and foreseeability or clarity of the law that we are already having, and the results are not really satisfying. And uh, 
my final point is on is on what Lotte mentioned on necessity and proportionality when it comes to regulating this kind of technology. And uh, I think a very important aspect that already existing regulation and probably any new or potential regulation might not be able to cover is the chilling effect or the impact of the chilling effect that becomes rather obvious, especially in the context of use of facial recognition in public spaces. Public authorities, even if they carry out a balancing assessment, a balancing exercise or risk assessment, will they ever be able to monitor the exact number of people, if they put that on a scale, the exact number of people that stayed home and did not attend a protest out of fear, or the exact number of people that were afraid because of their data security or how their data will be treated in case they are caught on facial recognition and did not protest, or the impact on other rights such as freedom of expression. So. And we also see that in the context of necessity and proportionality that if it will eventually, and probably it will eventually, boil down to a decision maker such as a judge, we also have the issue of judicial deference to the executive, especially in the national security or public security context. So I'm not entirely convinced that a new regulation, unless it's a moratorium forbidding the use of this technology at all, I don't think I don't think it will be able to regulate or at least come up with a very specific impact assessment to be taken into account. And that's why we see that risk assessment is the major concern in the leaked AI paper uh, that we saw on Friday. And uh, just to sum up, I think the question is pretty much for us in to ask ourselves in what kind of society we want to live in and how as CSOs we want to intervene in a sense of upholding liberties and whether any new regulation or attempt to regulate or proposal for regulation should be welcomed or whether it should be seen as actually saying something else, not regulation, active enforcement, or whether it's eventually going to be a step on having a more general approach towards sacrificing individual liberties for the sake of innovation or national security. Thank you. Excellent. Many thanks. So a very strong kind of taxonomy here and a kind of very strong um, um, advocacy for strong enforcement. Um, as we now, um, as I now kind of sandwiched the, um, the four interventions together, there's plenty of time for um, reactions from the room, questions uh, and interventions, um, especially the, um, something that you said, um, you'd, you'd like to see some DPAs um, uh, talk about this, so if there's someone in the room who wants to um, react to this, I'd be very welcome to have this. So I'd like to point out that we will get uh, 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 r some remarks um, in the end from uh, from our data protection supervisor. So um, yeah, I'd like to throw this into the room. Uh, who's got anything? Kind of, kind of any kind of immediate reactions to the to the f to the f um, four interventions? One, one right here. So uh, I was thinking to also to present you uh, what would happen in Romania with the case of the police wanting to do the same thing as in Serbia, but they didn't do it yet. The only difference is just that they use EU funds to finance that. But uh, I think it's something more important that we need to learn from this. And I think the moratorium, uh, the moratorium just means one thing, and we need to acknowledge this, that we have failed. We have failed because we spent too many hours on the text that uh, the GDPR and nice acronyms like DPIA, that means nothing outside the room 50 meters, and too less on functional things that work in uh, Bucharest, in Marseille, in Milano, or uh, wherever. Because DPIA for the police is just another paper with the title DPIA, as we heard from Danilo. In Romania, they didn't do the paper. They said, we don't have a DPIA. We don't need it. So all these cases show us that GDPR doesn't work in these cases. And um, we see three things that are repeating. The first one is a blatant uh, breach of GDPR. So it's just a law that doesn't apply. So you have other cases that the DPAs are enforcing. For example, a list of 23 people coming to the breakfast and someone did a copy on that, and not in a case when 20 million people or 8 million people are in the database and using facial recognition. Why? Um, the second thing is, is the total untransparency and, and the lack of public information, uh, even if you ask it or you don't ask it. 
And the third thing that happened in our case, and it happened before, and this should ring a bell more often, why do we allow European funds to be used for such projects? And how can we stop that? We tried that with another project and we failed miserably. So it's a good thing to learn from it. So I think it's the point when we need to, to pick up the pieces. Yes, we failed. And we, we need to think wh what we can do. Because if we talk about a new law, in the end, it will, it will go to the same process. We'll discuss a bit about nice acronyms. Maybe this time it will be PIA and not DPA and whatever. And who would apply that? The same DPAs that didn't apply the old law? So I think Ioannis uh, uh, was pointing correctly to look more for enforcement issues. And if there is one thing that the moratorium could do, I think it could stop the slippery slope that we see currently in the EU. So we can see that cases that uh, we heard about it in Marseille and there will be copycats. You know, there will be someone in Berger said, Marseille is doing it, why shouldn't we? And then someone in another city will do that. So that will probably put a temporary stop on it. What do we do later on? That's a complicated question. I'll let someone else to answer. Can I, is that related to the? So, I think the, um, just a, a few remarks. I'm Javier Ruiz from the Open Rights Group in the UK, you know, where we have a lot of uh, facial recognition going on right now. Actually, uh, I for years have been going through face recognition system to go into our office in London, you know, in the King's Cross um, development area next to where you get off from the Eurostar. And something that is interesting there in terms of the public space, um, one something that is a pro problematic when you were talking about private or public is the blurring of privatized spaces. And that's something that becomes quite problematic. So this is a whole area of London that is basically public but private. It's like a public space you walk through. It looks like a city, but it's not a city. It's actually a privatized space. So that's something that I think would be important to, um, to consider. Then in terms of the efficiency of these systems, I mean, I agree that we don't want to take that as a um, fundamental principle because they keep getting better. If you look at, I think it was Helen Nissenbaum did a report like back in the day and conclusion was that they didn't work then, but now I still think that we need to know if they work as a matter of principle, you know, even if it's not the main, you know, criteria for whether to stop them or not. And then going back to um, another point on CCTV, I mean, I think part of the problem is that we, to have face recognition of public space, you need to have CCTV and we are not regulating CCTV properly. And you see, I mean, in Spain, it's quite hard to get a CCTV camera in the street. In the UK, it's completely super easy. So I think something that we may want to consider is actually starting one step first. It's like, you know, do we actually want CCTV at all with or without face recognition, you know, and try to nip that one in the bud. You know, and I think interestingly, most of the, uh, of the debate in the UK has been triggered by the UK surveillance camera commissioner, not the information commissioner which brings an interesting question in terms of the regulators involved, you know, in these things. So I think that's um, something, yeah, something else to consider. Then in terms of the other technologies that we mentioned, I mean, I think that we tactically is good to focus on face recognition because it's something that people can see very clearly and it doesn't get esoteric. But it is true, what you don't want is ha to have again the whole cookie fingerprinting debate all over, you know, where we are focusing on face recognition. And by the time we got it regulated, you know, companies are not doing face recognition, they're doing gate analysis or they're doing something else. So I think that you need to keep an eye on the next big thing that is going to come. And again, goes back, if you have CCTV regulated, you know, you can regulate anything that is being done there. So in terms of the ban or not ban, I think that, yeah, the starting point should be, are there any acceptable uses, you know, after we put a ban? And I think that things that have been discussed in biometrics in the past, you know, is things like, you have local processing, st you don't store the data, you store a hash, uh, there is a system for revocation. There are certain things that could make some type of biometric processing more acceptable than others. And I think that, you know, that, is, you know, but is a, that could work in some cases, but I think that the starting point, I agree that it should be like at the moment, you know, a ban. If politically, I think also there is a confusion sometimes between moratorium and a ban. You know, I think even in this discussion, we kind of have used the words a bit interchangeably, but the moratorium is temporary and a ban is not. I think we have to be quite clear on that. Thank you, and also thank you for the useful distinction. Um, yeah, thanks, guys. Can you introduce yourself also? Hello, I'm Arthur from La Quadrature du Net 2. Uh, first thing, we did not fail against facial recognition. Actually, we won twice. 
uh, in Marseille, in Nice. Uh, I think we will uh, win again. No, actually, uh, what happened, there is two links winning those. So it was really enthusiastic. Uh, so the next step for us, uh, Noemi also, also say that, uh, we are going after the biggest facial recognition system in France, which is from 2012. One of our main legal arguments will be about, uh, I will tell you about, I would like to have your point of view about that. Uh, it's based on the Article 10 of the Police Directive. I think this is the strongest uh, provision we, we have right now, and I agree with you, with you guys when you say we don't need a new regulation. Actually, the Police Directive is really, really strong. So we will say that uh, this article, Article 10, provides that a uh, biometric system is only authorized if it, if it is strictly necessary. It's not just about necessity, it's, it's strict necessity. Uh, in French, it's translated as, as absolute necessity, which is even maybe stronger, I'm not sure. Uh, so the idea is if there is any other process, any other means to achieve the same goals, uh, the strict necessity test is not, uh, is, not, is not passed at all. And when we talk about facial recognition, it's always to, uh, to make some process easier, some, some, uh, some police work faster. So it shows that there is always another alternative, an alternative to facial recognition. So the necessity, the strict necessity test is always failed. So this simple legal argument may be enough just to, uh, to, uh, to reject any facial recognition system just bas based on one article on of the police directive. And I would like, would like to have some of your uh, opinion on this uh, legal argument. Thank you. Thank you. That's also a very interesting point on the necessity of, of, of doing that kind of um, AI-based surveillance. Uh, so maybe you can throw this back to our speakers. Dr. do you want to contribute or respond to that? Well, can, can I just do some things to react to? Yeah, <laughs> okay, <sure>. cool. <laughs> um, I had some thoughts about whether a moratorium should or stops a slippery slope. Um, I think this is exactly where our concerns are that when we put a moratorium, so the temporary uh, ban that other use cases of facial recognition technology might normalize this technology and put exactly this slippery slope um, on, on speed um, that when the moratorium, that the time limit is over, um, that we left with, with less protection. Um, and I think the question here is um, what, what means or what instrument uh, gives us the most protection? So this is one of our arguments why we are pleading um, for a ban. Um, I, I do agree with the, the strict necessity arguments. I think in existing regulation there are um, enough uh, rules. I, I really don't see space in existing regulation for uh, face surveillance in public space. Um, still, I don't have the feeling that um, this gives us enough protection when you um, see what happened with other surveillance technologies. So maybe it is right and we have to look at enforcement. Some more, some more interventions? Do you wanna, Jenny, do you wanna take me to that? Side, which is a moderator, and we'll just hand it to you. And then just uh, really bri briefly, um, I want to react to two points. First, Arthur mentioned uh, actually what Arthur mentioned about the strict necessity testing or generally necessity and proportionality is exactly one of the reasons why a new regulation wouldn't do much or wouldn't bring in a lot, to be honest. Uh, then it comes, of course, to how active our participation how active we want our participation to be when it comes to leaving these kind of things to the judiciary and their discretion to align by certain government strategies. That's the first thing. The second thing is I totally agree with uh, Javier's point on uh, the limits between public and private use or the privatization of public spaces or how we define public spaces nowadays. To add to that from a more uh, the organizational perspective of it, there are also the issue of privatization of surveillance and how we define a company such as the, the King's Cross ca case, for example, where it was being deployed by private corporation and then it turned out to be in collaboration with police or police handing out six images from their database just to check for certain people they consider to be dangerous. 
So that, that's also another question to come into play because then we also have the evading of responsibility of certain public sectors or local police bodies by hiding behind private corporations to carry out these functions. And private corporations, are they able to exercise, uh, are individuals able to exercise their rights before these corporations without even being aware? Or what kinds of um, data security standards apply to them that would comparably apply to a public body, for example? Right, um, just please introduce yourself for the people who can't read that. My name is uh, David Martin. I'm from the European Consumer Organization. Bill. I just briefly wanted to make two points. Uh, they have been touched upon uh, briefly by other speakers, but the first one is really about the need to look beyond just facial recognition and into biometric technology more generally and whatever m may come next, because uh, there are many issues which are more and more uh, often used, uh, many technologies, uh, fa uh, vocal recognition, uh, fingerprints, uh, for example, when you want to pay in stores and stuff like that. And this is becoming more and more normal. Here in Belgium, there's recently, it's been announced that Carrefour, which is a big supermarket chain, is doing a pilot uh, to test precisely that paying with fingerprints uh, of the registered users that they have uh, an account in Carrefour. And I think we're gonna see more and more of this uh, popping up everywhere which links me to my second point, which uh, I would like to underline the need to keep in mind not only the use by public authorities, public spaces, really there are lots of issues in terms of the use of this technology on commercial uh, context, in commercial context, be it uh, shopping, when you go there to a shop and they, they could even try to analyze what your reactions are on re in real time and try to adapt uh, the kind of offers that you, you get, for example. Um, of course, uh, all your pictures being scanned by social networks and other services, uh, um, unlocking your phone and accessing to events uh, via social uh, facial recognition. Ticketmaster also had this idea. If you want to access, a go to a concert, you don't need your ticket anymore. You, they will just look at your face and let you in. So I think that there are all of these uh, um, problematic cases where the, the legal problems are the same as we see in, in the uh, public space and policing and opacity, lack of transparency, lack of necessity, uh, not proportionate, etc., etc. The list goes on, data minimization, proximization. So we really, I would like to underline the not to forget these uh, aspects as well because they could very normalized uh, very easily as well um, as we're seeing with with uh, phones and face ID for example so in terms of the how to deal with all this of course I don't have the <laughs> the, the answer and I'm, I don't think there's a single answer but a lot starts with uh, actually enforcing what we have uh, with the GDPR and we definitely need the clear red lines let's say because we all agree that many of these uh, use cases might be forbidden already, but uh, um, we agree here in this room, maybe there's some people out there who actually do not agree with this. So we need actually um, stronger enforcement and uh, the time, the, the moratorium, let's say, could help us try to figure out all these questions and without uh, allowing for certain uses to be normalized. Uh, I, I'm not sure I entirely, I see your point uh, with the, it could backfire, but I think it could be helpful to stop certain things. And it might be more than just uh, public uh, facial recognition in public uh, spaces that we need to stop uh, as fast as we can. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Um, also, I, th I think an interesting point on the question of, you know, this is a uh, political battle, so um, the argument will not only be about data re uh, protection, about um, privacy rights, but also about what, you know, what constitutes uh, a legitimate use of, of any kind of surveillance technology. And I think at that point, when you look on the Amazon recognition websites, Amazon recognition being uh, um, facial recognition software by Amazon that is now used by law enforcement in the US, when you look on their website, um, they say, well, you know, this, um, this, this will help um, uh, law enforcement find missing children um, and, and e e some other e equally uh, emotionally evocative um, examples. So the, the there's also the political question is how do you respond to something that, you know, th that is has a dem demonstrable public benefit? How do, you, uh, uh, how do you say, what do you respond to that in, in terms of, um, s you know, challenging the effic efficacy of that uh, but uh, 
yeah, I was going to open this uh, to some more interventions. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Ella. Uh, I work at Edgery, and I just wanted to sort of give my agreement for what you said about the political side of it, because I think the regulation, uh, the regulatory debates are really important, but it's also just as much a political choice to use facial recognition. Um, I'm drawing on some of my experiences from the UK, for example, where we're seeing those in power, namely the police, uh, abusing facial recognition against those who have no power, people who are um, being surveilled by the police. So there's a real unequal power dynamic there in how it's being dis uh, deployed. Um, and further than that, it's being chosen as an austerity measure. Um, it's a way of cutting social services and supporting um, those political choices to not invest in proper policing, in potentially health service in the future. I think there are a lot of use cases where we can see this just replacing the humans um, in services that would really benefit from having human emotions and, and human abilities. Um, and just to really illustrate that point, uh, for me it's quite shocking when you hear that uh, austerity measures are being supported by facial recognition, um, but a UK policing commissioner recently was boasting in the press about how facial recognition was allowing him to make up for budget cuts. Um, so the fact that this is the, the narrative, I think, is, is a really important part of the debate that we need to keep in mind. Okay. Um, so one here, is there anyone? Yeah, there are people here. Well, let's go um, sequentially then. Hi. Yeah, uh, Daniel Lufer, I'm a Mozilla fellow at Access Now. Um, just to pick up on a couple of threads, um, one was the, the idea that we should very much split AI and facial recognition. I think this is, is really correct in most cases, but we should also, as a complement to that, pay attention to the very AI-based forms um, such as AI lie detection, uh, emotion recognition. These are not a kind of a strict you know, surveillance sort of an issue, and they're using very debatable uh, technologies from a scientific perspective. Um, it's also interesting from a European perspective because we have eye border control, uh, the AI lie detection that was being used um, on immigrants, um, which is Horizon 2020 funded. We also have SEWA, uh, Sentiment uh, Recognition in the Wild, uh, which is also Horizon 2020 funded and being used to develop an ad targeting engine uh, to exploit your emotions uh, to target. Now, these are not kind of strictly standard surveillance issues, and there's, there's really a, a very scientifically debatable AI foundation to them. So I think we can also think about if we split it off the AI question off from certain uses, how do we tackle the ones where <coughs> we really do need to look at it? It's also interesting because there's no accuracy issue because it's kind of the very fundamental premise of the technology that's that's debatable. So it strategically, we have to tackle it in a different way. Um, also, um, I think worth noting that every technology used for commercial purposes at some point repurposed for or can be repurposed for surveillance um, later on. Fukami. Uh, I have more of a, uh, and a practical question. Uh, so um, a couple of days, a story uh, about Clearview broke, which is like a, um, a big database of uh, faces that polices, uh, uh, that police forces use um, allegedly from uh, the US, but very likely also in Europe in order to uh, identify people. Uh, and my question is if the EDPS uh, is on that case in any form and what do you guys recommend to actually do? Uh, with that uh, particular case. Do you want to react to that right away or do you want to save it for later? Yeah, great. To add to the comment about uh, facial recognition being an austerity, part of an austerity measure or an austerity fix in the UK, I think especially in the UK in policing, we also have to recognize that there's a lack of a political vacuum. There's a complete political vacuum of the use of data and technology within policing. So the Home Office is not taking a stand, but they are putting funds towards the use of this. So it's like an escalation of or a complication of many sort of vacuums in which this is operating. And I think when we talk about the use of facial recognition in the wild, these are the things we have to take into account um, because a lot of the efforts are currently directed at police. 
but what about all the funding mechanisms of actually making this possible or political vacuum that's making this possible? Thank you. Um, just an invitation maybe for the DPAs um, which are uh, around um, the room uh, and also a question about enforcement if you think that's, that's uh, key. I would like to know um, then what more can be done for, for enforcing but also about the DPAs ability to cover the whole range of, of human rights uh, that are impacted by facial recognition uh, beyond data protection and privacy and uh, if in the countries where that were covered like in France and the UK and, and, and others other uh, national human rights institutions so ombudsmen or um, other equality bodies have uh, started tackling the, the issue as well or police complaint authorities um, I would like to know whether there's like other actors that could be um, giving a hand to DPAs if it's quite hard to cover also the whole range of impact. So is there anyone from the DPAs here who wants to respond to that? We, can, we cannot force anyone of course to speak um, so yeah uh, maybe just very quickly, um, because in France we had actual cases and we could so see uh, what the DPA did or didn't do actually. And so there is a very big issue uh, that we saw since GDPR, uh, public, so public authorities like cities, they don't have to ask the authorization to DPA before implementing the technology. Then in France, uh, the CNIL, we are quite criticizing it because it takes a lot of time to and some we think it la it's maybe a lack of courage to to go to go and really confront those cities because they don't with the GDPR we don't really know what what what, what it can do but it's only with the they only collaborate with it for example for high schools uh, they were uh, they were uh, consulted and the only thing they said they said was oh uh, so the pictures yeah don't do so some centralized database but put the photos on on the ID of, of the students uh, and finally after complaining with by us by uh, parents by kids finally the DPA took a strong position so what I want to say is just that DPA today in France is not very cor courageous and we don't <laughs> no but the thing is it maybe the law don't give it don't give it uh, too many tools when it comes to public authorities because it's it has to control and it, it has al also a lot to do and just last things uh, our minister who wants to frame the experiments uh, wants to create a new authorities just to control experimental uh, facial recognition I think, and with like, well, so we think that it should be actually the DPA, the DPA's um, function. So you asked if there are other authorities in France. There is no one, but they are creating one just to regulate it and just to see what can be accepted. But for us, the DP it should be the DPA's function. Yeah. So it's also I think worthwhile um, pointing out. So as Andrea Jelinek uh, keeps uh, pointing out, uh, DPAs are severely under-resourced uh, ac across Europe, so um, that also really contributes to the question. Oh, wait, yeah, so wh who was first? Can anyone help me out here? Okay, so uh, I'll get to you and then I'll get to you eventually. I just wanted to add something about the resources of the... Um, my name is uh, Harmony Vovietan. I'm a... Um, a privacy and security manager for IO. This is um, uh, a firm um, promoting an ad blocker. Um, I wanted to say about the DPN France that it is clearly a political um, choice to give less resources to the DPS so they can't basically do anything. For example, the public um, administration in charge of regulating the TV programs have more budget than the DPA in France. So that's really ridiculous. Um, I was a uh, proposed uh, job uh, for the DPA. A, they wanted to pay me 
hundred uh, euros a month. And I'm an exper experimented lawyer. So that's really ridiculous. Hello, this is Fabiana from the UK Information Commissioner's Office. Uh, I just wanted to add the regulatory perspective uh, and you know, go back to your question about what we are doing. Um, I just wanted to mention that at the back of the uh, bridges against um, South Wales Police uh, case, which by the way, it's now being appealed in the Court of Appeal, um, the UK Information Commissioner issued um, an opinion uh, aimed, um, you know, aimed at clarifying our position on the use, um, on the ICO's views on the use of live facial, re facial recognition technology and kind of clarifying for police and other law enforcement authorities what the strict necessity is, uh, which was, uh, you know, being based, uh, it should be targeted, intelligence-led and, um, and time-limited, so tied to clear retention policies and it's now calling for um, a binding statutory uh, code of practice uh, um, to be introduced uh, in, uh, in the UK at the back of the... Yes, you're not. We'll see, I guess. Um, I think our position is that... No, we d I don't think you know that qu the answer to that question yet. Uh, but it's a step forward, I guess. One here? No? Okay. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> hi, I work for the Czech DPA. We had the same opinion on facial recognition statements, so which was negative. But I'm not in a position to say anything openly. <laughs> I don't have a mandate. But uh, obviously, the uh, yeah, the issue of financing is a big one and of course please give us some time and don't think that enforcement by the DPA should be only thing <laughs> will save us from the facial recognition that's being deployed very interesting point uh, oh sorry In France, actually, we, we don't go before the DPA anymore. We just go straight before judges, before courts, and we don't work with the DPA, it's just too useless. And the courts are actually quite fast sometimes, so just go to court. Anyone from is anyone from the CNIL here? Like it would be a bit... <laughs> 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 okay. Um, yes. Can we maybe bring this back to the table a bit? Uh, were, were there any more interventions um, at the moment? Okay. So do you, shall we, what did the organizers say? Oh yeah, okay. So, Jan. Thank you. Thank you also for the great uh, discussion so far. Uh, there is one point that I have been missing so far as, a, as an answer because uh, regulation has been mentioned a couple of times. Some said, GDPR is enough. Others said GDPR is useless, doesn't work. Um, and then some said, yeah, you know, we should maybe do some regulation, but it wasn't quite sure which one. And I'd like to, if it is possible, um, kind of carry on the debate in the direction where, where we talk about what kind of regulation we would like to see. Um, because people, are so as a civil society in Brussels, we, we get that question quite often from policymakers. They, they want to know what should we do about it? Uh, what can we do about it? Um, maybe we can try to work on, on answers in this direction. So maybe that that would be an uh, opportune moment for uh, last intervention from our two speakers. So. Um, well, unfortunately, I won't have the answer. <laughs> um, but I think there is a large difference here between uh, theory and practice. Um, if we look at our uh, legal instruments, then I would say it doesn't really leave space for uh, face surveillance, for example. So I would say do it with existing regulation um, because if that doesn't work, I don't see why new regulation would um, because it's already quite tight. Otherwise, if we look at the practice, um, I also see that it might not be enough. Um, so yeah, I don't have the answer, but I see the problem there. 
with this, I would like to hand it over to our European Data Protection Supervisor for the closing remarks. Thank you. If you want, I, I may not uh, treat it as closing remarks. If there, if there is a need for further discussion after that, uh, we, we can uh, still stay. I, I'm, I'm here also to stay to, to discuss with you. Uh, let me first say that I'm really happy uh, to be here because that's the place where the NGOs and the civic society representatives are meeting with themselves, which also means that there might be the synergic, uh, uh, synergic uh, value in the fact uh, that all these experiences are put in one place uh, and passed further. Uh, I th there are some representatives of the DPA in the room. I'm not surprised that they are not going to, put to, to give the political statements. Uh, especially if they have in the room also the NGOs that are making the litigation right now in the cases where they are also involved. The DPAs are also involved. So if we don't have this nice situation as I have, that I'm the supervisor and everything which I say is the opinion of the DPS, so they are in this worse situation that they, can, that they will have to say that whatever they will say is not an official position of the of the uh, data protection authority so uh, uh, but anyway it's very important that uh, we have the possibility as the data protection authorities uh, to listen to the examples not only from the state where we are coming from not only from the jurisdictions that we are uh, used to and not only from the place where the oversight over the those who are doing the surveillance will be the same because we have to answer the, f the the, the first thing, it looks different from country to country, also because the scope of the uh, oversight uh, from the Data Protection Authority or any other authorities might be different. It also looks different because there is a different definition of those who are under the Law Enforcement Directive or not. Yeah? In my country of origin, there are the, author uh, there are the authorities uh, where it's hard to say if they are under the uh, Police Directive or not because they are at the same time the Secret Services and the Police which is in, uh, heretic in the other countries. So there are the differences between the countries, definitely. And the only way to approach that from the European perspective uh, is to meet at the places like that and to meet uh, between the regulators uh, and between those who have uh, the contact with it uh, uh, on the ground. And uh, uh, that, that would be the first thing which uh, I would like to stress, that this kind of exchange of information is uh, extremely important for us. The, the, the subject is not new. The subject is not something which appeared last few months. Uh, we have in the room the people who were uh, here in Brussels. Uh, it was probably 2013, I would guess, or 2012, uh, where we had a big discussion about the INDEC project, uh, which was also presenting itself at the CPTP conference. Uh, and it was one of the first scientific projects done in the universities, uh, which was preparing the dual use uh, surveillance uh, systems. And uh, that's an important thing what happened with this project. The project was finished at some point, uh, and I have a contact with the people who were involved in this project then, and they are not working on the subject anymore, and their universities are not working on the subject anymore. They don't have a clue if what they prepared has even been introduced or not into the law enforcement uh, area. And that was a that was the, the it, it was said in the project that it should be used only for law enforcement area. So they also don't know if it was not passed further. So uh, the, the discussion is not new, and the discussion is something that we went through already some years ago, not being uh, not being aware that it will come back so uh, so soon, so so fast. Uh, we thought that this is still the scientific discussion about the use of the algorithmic solutions uh, for the very uh, uh, for the very far future, but it is not. But it would be good to check if we ask the questions already before, and what answers did we get? Because some of the answers that you are asking about right now are, for example, almost the same as the ones that we asked when we were the regulating the CCTV. And the best example of that is I heard uh, uh, the uh, doubts, what is the public area, what is not the public area. Come on, this discussion has been done already a few years ago, and uh, the uh, ownership does not mean anything in this. That's the problem of the accessibility of the area. Yeah? So we have public accessible areas uh, where everybody can go, and there is no... Th there was no question that the fact if it's owned by the private company or by the public company, it does not change anything. 
there are semi-public places, the places where somebody decides if somebody can go in or not. And this place is the one like that, because you should not get into the room if you are not the person who is at the conference. But at the on the other hand, it's quite a public area. So it's one of the semi-public. There, there are areas which are public but corporate at the same time. So that's the place where we have the company who is the, uh, the owner of that, uh, and it's only one who is controlling, uh, who is getting in. But the employees uh, of the company don't stop to be the human beings. They are still the human beings. And finally, there are very private areas, uh, which are the homes which might be uh, regulated differently. But from the facial recognition point of view, this is not the most important, uh, uh, this is not the most important subject if we talk about the uh, private or public uh, areas, but it might be very important uh, who is doing the, the, the uh, facial recognition, who is using this uh, technology. So uh, the some of the studies on these basic questions have been done recently by F uh, Fundamental Rights Agency. I think most of you are aware of the studies that they uh, did. There are some examples that are given there, for example, for those projects which were funded from the, EU, uh, from the EU funds, which is an interesting question. I will go to that uh, uh, in, the while, uh, in the while as well. So let me start uh, with uh, uh, two examples that the problem goes far uh, beyond the problem of identification of the person. Uh, it has already been said here about the problem of the, uh, of the uh, recognizing emotions. And uh, that is a very interesting area where we have interesting uh, cases already in Europe. Uh, the, in one of the countries, uh, one of the banks uh, uh, is uh, controlling the employees this way to find out that if they smile enough towards the client. Uh, it may sound funny, but the people, the appraisal of the people may uh, uh, include uh, the information about their emotions or rather the expression of the emotions because you know better than me that uh, uh, the, uh, the smile does not, necessarily, uh, uh, does not necessarily express the real emotion of the person. Uh, the second thing is the chilling effect, which also appeared here for a while and which is a very important thing to, to discuss uh, but before we start to regulate something, uh, if we want to regulate something, uh, because the chilling effect uh, is actually bigger when you don't know what is going on than when you know what is going on. So if we have the precise information what, who and how is uh, surveilling us, uh, that's anyway, the, the, it has still all the cons of the surveillance and all the cons of the public control. But at the same time, the situation where we don't know if there is a facial recognition, if there is a surveillance which is connected with it, might be even worse. The, um, a, a little bit uh, sarcast sar sarcastically, I may say that it's a funny effect, uh, has been described by the people who recently had uh, the classes in the universities in China. They said that five, six years ago, uh, that was a very interesting uh, uh, exercise to go to China with the lectures because you got a lot of questions from the students. Uh, and uh, these questions were sometimes uh, good, sometimes interesting, sometimes stupid, sometimes offensive. Uh, but anyway, that was a, bi that was a big challenge uh, to face the people with completely different way of thinking about the, 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 the things. And recently, last year, uh, it started to go down, and now the rooms are generally silent. And the reason for that are the cameras which are around, and the fact uh, that most of the students knew, know that uh, there is something uh, which they are compared with uh, and there is probably somebody who is uh, uh, assessing their behavior. And mo probably it's done automatically and nobody knows how it works. So it's better to stay calm, it's better to stay silent. I said sarcastically because probably it will actually uh, harm the science in this uh, country because the science is anyway the, 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 the critics first of all. So I said that f uh, discussion about facial recognition is different from the discussion from the artificial intelligence. Of course there are overlaps and there are the things which are which uh, uh, can be discussed together but I'm afraid a little bit that if we start to discuss both of these things together 
then we will have a discussion about facial recognition and the regulation of that and the allowance to, to have the facial recognition. For those of you who are completely against facial recognition, I would propose you to say strictly that this is something else than artificial intelligence because we will have the regulation of, on artificial intelligence, whatever it means. It, it will be included because it will be implemented because of the political need, because of the social need, because of the real technical issues that are existing there. If we add facial recognition to the same discussion, you will have the regulation in the same legal act. Because most of the people will not understand what does it mean algorithms, but they will understand what does it mean facial recognition. So uh, be careful. It's better to discuss this both. I, I'm not saying that I'm fully against facial recognition. I passed the, the, the border control yesterday, and of course I used the, the one where the passport was, uh, uh, was scanned, despite the fact that I knew that I don't need to do it. And moreover, in the other, que the, the other queues was, the other queue was not longer than my queue to the electronic one. But simply, I had my passport in hand, and I really didn't have uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the didn't want to, to use anything else than the theoretically very automatic way of recognizing uh, my face. Uh, it's also, as I said, a little bit different from the discussion about CCTV, but uh, uh, we th the, the discussion about the CCTV shows how big are the differences between the countries uh, in the EU. Uh, when the uh, uh, European Data Protection Board started to discuss about the opinion on uh, CCTVs, uh, uh, we found out that there is a country in, e uh, in EU where the police is encouraging the people to have the dashboard cameras in the car, while the other bordering country, with this one that where the police is so active, uh, uh, has the total ban for the dashboard cameras. So uh, on the area, which is the Schengen area, where you don't even find out that you cross the border, you are coming from the country where it's, uh, uh, where it's promoted by the police to the country where it's forbidden by the police. And uh, that shows that the differences uh, may exist. And that is probably an interesting, uh, interesting question to be asked also to all the people who are thinking about the regulation. Does it mean that the existence of the regulation will make more order in Europe? Will create the situation where we have at least the same solutions all over Europe? On the other hand, is it worth to do it? Let's use the uh, positive and negative uh, approach to the examples we had with the retention. We had a time when there was a di directive on retention, which uh, I think most of the people in this room, if not all the people in this room, were fighting with. Uh, yeah? And we have the situation now without the retention uh, directive, uh, where the situation in each of the countries is absolutely different and decided only by the country, not by the, by the European Union. Uh, what I would like to uh, ask you not to go too far in, and I said the same at the Freedom of Field Conference, is uh, don't concentrate of the pro on the problem of accuracy of uh, facial recognition. Because if I was the producer of the systems like that, I would really encourage you to uh, point this problem. Because being the producer, I need more research and more money from wherever I can, including these public resources, in order to make my system better. The only thing what I would require from you as the NGOs would tell me what is the margin of the mistake that you would understand as the accep acceptable. And probably some of you will say three, and then I will say, okay, when I will reach three, everything is done, yeah? Everybody will agree, because they already declared years ago that three is enough for them. So be careful, because this is the way to wrap, actually, the whole discussion into the technical field, which is not the real, real one that we have to talk about. We should talk about the fundamental right uh, and the possible intrusion in the field which is uh, uh, covered by that. Data protection impact assessment, Yes, I absolutely agree with all the people who said that data protection impact assessment, if it's done uh, in the proper way, is the proper tool that may uh, solve most of the problems which are connected with the different kind of uh, visual recognition uh, system and facial recognition systems as well. But I would add to that that unfortunately it should be done for per each camera, not par by per system. 
because if it's really data protection impact assessment and not the homologation of the uh, of the software or homologation of the uh, hardware then the camera which is put and the fact that somebody is recognized put it in the same hospital in the place where it, let's just keep the corridors only you are only in the corridors so to put it in the, the camera like that in the hospital in the publicly accessible area uh, next to the dentist's uh, um, dentist cabinet uh, would not be that invasive despite the fact that the people are really uh, uh, are really hurting there but to put the same camera with the same features in the same corridor but next to the uh, to the um, clinic of par uh, planned parenthood for example or uh, pla a planned f uh, family is much more intrusive uh, from different points of views uh, in the uh, privacy of the of the person so unfortunately it has to be done even farther and that's my call to the data protection authorities also connected with the things that we have with the da with the uh, eu institutions if you don't like the data protection impact assessment which is done by the institution by the uh, by the entity just don't accept it or just say this is not the way how the data protection impact assessment should be done uh, because this is something where we can uh, as data protection impact uh, data protection authorities uh, do quite a lot but also can be helped about the uh, cooperation of the NGOs which uh, uh, didn't appear that much in the discussion today uh, I would uh, like to ask you to keep the contact with those NGOs those part of the civic societies which might be in favor of having the facial recognition and we should not be surprised that they are they are these are for example the NGOs which are dealing with the lost children and this is one of the pretexts which is often heard by the data protection authorities uh, that we actually introduce this uh, facial recognition system in the airport or in the especially in the uh, uh, railway station because that's the place where you can find out the child which is lost uh, despite the fact that of course the accuracy uh, in the, uh, the facial recognition of the child is uh, much lower but I said don't talk about accuracy uh, that's uh, definitely the thing that we have to talk with the NGOs dealing with the, uh, the problem at, at least to make them aware of the fact uh, that there are some other questions in the field uh, and that they have to be aware of that and secondly that they can be misused uh, by those who actually want to use uh, uh, the facial recognition uh, uh, systems to different purposes that this probably uh, uh, the, the, this uh, uh, mm, purpose that we probably will uh, agree with uh, although I'm absolutely proof uh, for the arguments about the uh, uh, looking for the bad guys uh, instead of looking for the good guys uh, so I heard many many times in my life uh, that uh, the systems like that or different kinds of surveillance are done only in, in order to find the uh, bad guys and those who are good should not be afraid of that the first time I heard it was in, uh, in uh, 1982 I was 11 years old that was uh, Poland under the communist regime and there was a militiaman who came to my uh, school my primary school and who was explaining why there is this, uh, the why, why they are listening to the telephone conversation and why they are reading the snail mail uh, that is sent between the people and exactly that these were the words we are looking only for bad people you should not be aware you should not be afraid your parents should not be afraid because we do it only for the social good and I remember that me not being from the opposition family and not understanding too much already had something in the head yeah but, but who is deciding who is bad or good and the second uh, what does it mean the good of society or societal good as uh, as he uh, uh, tried to explain it so uh, EU funds used for that very interesting question I'm not aw I'm not sure if we should ban totally the use of that but what we definitely need is to have the full transparency of this project and what I would add as uh, the uh, as an important point all transpa the transparency of all follow-ups what happened with this project how was it used it should all be strictly said that this is in the public domain that this is something that should be in the in the in the public domain and should be accessible uh, through the freedom of information uh, request and uh, at the same time uh, at the same time we were asked about uh, 
what the DPAs are doing and what the DPAs can do about it. Well, of course, I have to say that the scope of uh, uh, responsibility of the data protection authorities is different. So for some of them, it's an uh, obvious part of their activity already for years, because, for example, they were responsible for uh, for oversight of the CCTVs, uh, while in other countries there is no regulation about CCTVs even, not uh, mentioning the fact that uh, uh, they that they are mm, that there were no uh, authority for that. Uh, of course, we can say that they are that the data protection authorities are not uh, financed enough, or they do, do not have enough uh, uh, staff. Uh, that that that's the argument that always can be said. But what we definitely have to uh, admit is that there are bigger and smaller data protection uh, authorities, and even the German ones are not big. There are a lot of data protection authorities in Germany, but not necessarily they are the big ones. Yeah? So it does not mean that they are the specialists of each subject uh, uh, in each uh, of the authorities. If you decide that because of the bad experience you don't want to contact your data protection authority and pass the knowledge to them anymore, then actually this is, let's say, the very controversial choice. Uh, the people are changing, uh, in the authorities especially. So the thing that you had uh, uh, a year ago is not necessarily true anymore. And that they need an information. And they need the cases. They need the examples. They need to understand what was going on. The, the we try to do it on the, the uh, EDPB level, of course. Uh, I'm sorry, I simply don't use this telephone, uh, so probably this advertisement that is uh, trying to achieve me. Okay, uh, so uh, they are they, they are different one from another. There is a different uh, uh, there is a different uh, knowledge uh, uh, among the people uh, inside the uh, data uh, uh, protection authorities, uh, and uh, getting the uh, examples, getting the explanations is an important uh, part. We try to do it in the EDPB, but. Uh, uh, probably it's better if those who have the contact with the real cases uh, can pass the information about them to the uh, data protection authorities but also to the other authorities which are dealing with the, with the fact. And of course, at the same time, we should raise awareness among the people, uh, raise awareness on which uh, of the funny things that they found in the Internet are actually the part of the discussion about the facial recognition because if... Uh, uh, millions of people around Europe are using the uh, the, the uh <coughs> application which uh, uh, allows them to uh, find how they will be aging, so how their face will look like in 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So it, it, it's easy to understand that this is the way to test uh, the results uh, of, the of something which will be then used for the facial recognition. And the fact that you are leaving your... Uh, assessment, was it good or bad, or did you like it or not, not like it, uh, uh, is uh, uh, simply the help to the companies like that. And uh, uh, also, of course, the the that, not, that was not the quiz, but uh, once again, the application that was check looking for so-called digital twins, digital twins in the meaning that you were putting your uh, picture in, and it was searching the internet, trying to look for the other people who look similar. And you were able to assess if the person is really uh, similar to you or not, or if it's really your picture or not your picture, or the picture of somebody who, who really looks like you, and that's nothing better than the social assessment of the uh, of the facial recognition system. So a lot of, a lot to do definitely on all the sides. Uh, uh, we uh, we will have to do this exercise as well as the uh, EDPS. We had a, sh a short discussion about uh, uh, the our role as EDPS in this discussion. Of course, we have the role because if there is any kind of discussion on the, uh, on the uh, regulation on the European level, we will take part in it. But we also ask ourselves, is it something that is important for EDPS and for the agency which is uh, supervising uh, uh, EU authorities? Uh, well, we, we don't know about the systems like that being, empl being uh, uh, employed, especially in the public areas. But we can easily imagine that the first moment to test them is the open day of the EU institutions in Brussels, which is always in the beginning of May. And for security reasons, uh, 
uh, trying to, to, to use the facial recognition system is a good uh, uh, idea for some of the people. So we are just expecting uh, something like that. Uh, just believing that it's absolutely obvious out of the uh, regulation for the EU institutions and the work of the EDPS uh, that there has to be data protection impact assessment before and it has to look like a data protection impact assessment because even if the agencies which are dealing with the law enforcement authorities can fail to prepare data protection impact assessment then it means that we really check if it is one. Okay, thank you very much and of course I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, to take part in the rest of the discussion. We still have um, 20, 25 minutes. Um, can to this very kind of sweeping uh, remarks, I hope there is, uh, I think there, there might be some some interest in further interventions. I see one at least. Is there any other obvious one? Okay. Okay, well, then let's start with that. Gloria González Fuster from VOB. I had a question about the, the follow up of uh, funding uh, of, of projects because you were like, optimistic saying we could have all this information in the public domain, and I, I think it's a problem now as it is because many of these deliverables are confidential and I've been in uh, the ethics committee following up and they were confidential to me as an ethics reviewer. They will not show me the impact assessment of the research that was being funded by the EU. So how optimistic are really you sincerely about this uh, reaching the pub public domain? Thank you. Yeah, the moment when I finish uh, such an uh, improvised speech is the moment when I find on my cards uh, uh, the points which I didn't raise. And one of them was exactly the, the one that uh, Professor Fusner is uh, uh, asking about. Uh, uh, different layers of the transparency. I, of course, use the v simplification saying that everything has to be public. Of course, there might be probably the things which are not public. But in my, my opinion, the word transparency has also several mi uh, s s meaning of several layers of transparency. The fact that we are uh, allowing all the people to see uh, the, uh, the, the descriptions uh, of the uh, applications uh, does not mean that we expect all the people around the world uh, to understand what is, what is written down it, uh, in such an uh, information from the producer. Uh, because we believe that there are, but, but we believe that there are the organizations like Velf or like uh, other consumer organizations that can probably understand it. And that already shows that we understand by, uh, uh, by default that there might be different layers of uh, uh, transparency. There's a different layer generally for everybody, probably the different one for the ethics committee that probably may know more, but there might be the parts uh, which uh, uh, are uh, not accessible uh, to the general public or even to the ethical committees of the uh, of that. But that is why you have the data protection authorities for that the data protection authorities that should be accountable to, to, our, uh, to, to you. Well, if I have a right to look to the terrorist files uh, in order to uh, check if the data is uh, properly, uh, uh, properly processed uh, by the police authorities uh, and by, by Europol, it means that the data protection authorities should have the right like that. And uh, well-educated good prepared uh, data pr uh, protection authority should be uh, useful at least uh, in getting the information about what was the follow-up of the money that was used in the, uh, in the project like that. So I agree that this is simplification to say that everything should be in the public domain, but uh, I, also uh, I also would like to stress that there are different people that should be the representatives of the rights of the people in such a, in such a process. And uh, I hope that the data protection authorities can be, uh, can be of help in this, uh, uh, in this field. Uh, I will use this microphone to, to say about one more thing that we can do all together and uh, that we can somehow use uh, one of the unfortunate things which, is which are going on right now uh, in Europe in the discussion about facial recognition. That's something a little bit different than the professor uh, was asked about. But, uh, well, as you know, there are the countries in Europe where at the moment there is a s the very hard situation as far as the rule of law is concerned. And some of them have even fighting against uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, ju judicial system, ju judges in the countries. 
and uh, the judges are protesting against that, uh, and the judges are actually prosecuted for the fact that they are taking part in the protests, uh, which shows very well that the uh, that the recordings uh, are used not only in the cases against hooligans and not only in the case of the violent clashes in the cities, uh, but they are also used uh, in order to find out the people who are using their right to protest, uh, even if they have uh, 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 special professions. And, uh, they, uh, and the uh, prosecution against them is done in order to create the chilling effect. Because not in order to, to really punish them, because they will not be fi finally punished. They will not be finally punished. Finally, they will be most probably, uh, uh, the, the courts will not fo uh, follow the accusations. But uh, it is started in order to tell to the people, you will have the problems if you go to the demonstration, you will have the problems if you uh, show your, uh, mm, uh, your point of view. And these unfortunate situations which are going on right now in Europe and not only in Europe, uh, of course Hong Kong is the best example at the moment, uh, uh, are the, the things that we should use as a good example. This is also why we uh, started our blog post uh, uh, about facial recognition some uh, months ago uh, with uh, this uh, citation, let's say, from Bruce Lee, be like water, be water. Yeah. Any more reactions to that? Yes. Um, hi, I'm Evelyn from Bits of Freedom. I'm not sure, but I think uh, Fukami's question about what we can do from Europe um, against Clearview specifically um, hasn't been addressed yet. Um, uh, I, I, was I would like to uh, ask the question to everyone in this room. What is a, a, a good way forward on this? Because from from the the reporting on it, um, I, it seems pretty clear that um, uh, pictures of, of Europeans were also used um, in this uh, software. So I'm curious if anyone has any ideas. Yes, indeed, and it's also I yes, yes, definitely. I was just going to say that um, the, the the company itself was saying that the uh, pictures were in the public domain. Yeah. Well. Uh, of course, the only thing what I can say about the uh, uh, about the EU uh, institutions uh, and agencies is that we never found any example that they were involved in such a process. If we think about the national police forces or the other authorities which are dealing on with uh, uh, de dealing with the biometric data, uh, we definitely will pass the question to the uh, bodies that uh, are gathering data protection authorities. But as I said, the answers might be uh, different in different countries uh, uh, according to the scope of, uh, uh, of uh, duty of the data protection authorities. But of course, I don't think that uh, the police authorities uh, are taking part in the uh, passing this, uh, uh, this, this data uh, to another uh, destination. But we have to remember that uh, the agreements between the public authorities uh, are the transfer tool which is given by GDPR and the control, how this tool is used in each and every country, might be an important part of the activity, both of the Data Protection Authority, but also of the uh, civic society. Are the countries in any kind of uh, international agreements that might be used in order to pass the data between the public authorities? Hi, my name is Lefteris Hiliwakis. I'm from Homo Digital, it's a civil society from Greece. I have a question related to dual use and military use of uh, research results, especially for Horizon 2020 programs. We see that many, many organizations and many companies that participate and win uh, these tenders are organizations from the defense field. Uh, so for me, it's a little bit uh, difficult to say that uh, we are not going to use these research results for military use or for dual use if uh, companies like Thales are participating in big projects like that. Uh, do you think that these companies belong uh, to EU funds to, in, to researching ideas, taking money from EU funds, you b think that they belong to this environment or that they belong to the environment of public-private partnership between the European Union and these big companies. We saw, for example, Airbus signing a public-private pa partnership with the European Commission on uh, satellites in order to create more uh, knowledge and understanding of how we can use satellites for migration control, for example. So these big companies, do they belong to this environment? 
should we follow the way that the data is uh, uh, the data protection exists in the former second pillar of the EU or where are the regulations about the second pillar of the EU where are the regulations which are dealing in any sense with this does it mean then that uh, we are simply saying if the EU European Union funds are used uh, they are used for the European Union covert uh, uh, purposes of course I would say yes and that's an easy answer but you gave the best example, I guess, which was uh, Airbus. Uh, well, I, I cannot say that the technologies which are used by uh, uh, Airbus are uh, uh, any way we can limit them only to the civilian use uh, and say that the military use will not exist. Uh, the only thing what I can say is that one of the most difficult subjects that we are uh, discussing uh, as the EDPS at the moment uh, is the problem of the border between the those agencies which are dealing in the law enforcement uh, area and which are definitely covered by the uh, either their own legal act or by the, uh, uh, the EU uh, regulation for the EU agencies uh, and uh, the national uh, military forces uh, and uh, of course you know very well that uh, wh when uh, fighting with uh, migration as it's called or trying to regulate migration uh, the uh, EU institutions, EU agencies uh, are cooperating on a day-by-day -day basis with the national forces, which are the military forces. So the only thing I can say is that this is one of the biggest su subjects for us, for the normal uh, uh, existence and uh, operation of these agencies. Uh, and it's hard for me to say if we can easily say that uh, there will be no dual use. No, we should rather expect the dual use and we should rather point the possibility of the dual use of the uh, of the uh, technologies. Thank you very much. My name is Petra Molnar. I'm a Mozilla Fellow at Edry and an immigration lawyer from Canada. Uh, not to belabor the point around borders, but I would like to follow up on your um, response to the gentleman's question over there with, I suppose, then what? What do we do if we recognize that there is a dual purpose behind a lot of the use of this technology, particularly in these intra-jurisdictional spaces where we are seeing even actors outside of the European Union acting in ways that are difficult to regulate. What, what are we going to do about that? I'm afraid I don't have a clear answer about the open seas, definitely. I don't have this open uh, answer. And, uh, well, we should not expect the global regulation in the nearest future. And we have to uh, remember that we anyway have the problem right now in Europe uh, with the transfer of the data to the vessels which are usually under the flag of uh, Antigua and Barbuda or Panama, which are definitely not the countries of the EU, even if the shipper is from the EU country. So even uh, when we are crossing the channel with the uh, ferry, we may probably go to the third state and the transfer of data to the ferry is the transfer of data to the third uh, uh, state. This is th these are the things which nobody discusses in the EU at the moment. I think we're with... Um less than 10 minutes to go, maybe it's time to wrap up. Huh? Unless there are any other questions. Time for, or Dan, do you want to come? No, no, I, well, I think, I think I've uh, sp spoke for enough. <laughs> yeah, I think it's been an intense uh, discussion and uh, it would be good that uh, you get a chance to still attend some of the very interesting panels that are still ongoing. So just to really express gratitude to everyone for your question and input. Uh, thank you to Lotte, to Noemi, to Danilo and Ioannis for, for the food for thought. I know that the discussion will be you know, ongoing within the network. There's already a kind of informal discussion in the side of CPDP uh, that uh, Lotte is organizing. So please uh, reach out to Lotte if you want to be part of that. Thanks again to, to the EDPS for the, um, the discussions and it would be interesting to see how we can continue this meaningful cooperation throughout the year and maybe in, in the next year. And thanks again to, to the EDRI team for organizing. Thank you. And
let, let me just say that uh, during this uh, event uh, I've been accompanied by a number of people from EDPS uh, who are representing all our fields of activity. There were the people from the private office, from the uh, policy and consultation team, from supervision and enforcement team, and the people from the IT policy team, including two persons who are here at the table with their names, so this, the, their names I can reveal. It's Thomas Zerdik, who is the head of the uh, ITP, so means IT policy team, and uh, Achim Prebunde, who is my advisor in the technical field.